Assalamu alaikum. My name is Wakar Haider. Um, I was born in, in London, in Orpington, but I've lived my whole life um, in Harrow in northwest London. Um, I've been working for British Airways uh, at Heathrow Terminal 5 um, for the last 22 years. Um, in terms of Sayyidi Shahada and Imam Sayyidi Salam, how as a child we learnt about this. Back in the 70s, there were only two Husseiniyas um, in, in London. Uh, one was um, Muhammad the Trust, which was founded by the late Raja Mahmudabad of India. Now, he was a very um, pioneering figure of Azadari in this country, but it's not just that he found, did he found Muhammad Trust, he also founded the London Regent's Pass Mosque, uh, and he was the first director. So as a Shia person, he was actually the founder of, um, of London Regent's Pass Mosque. So as a child, we went to, um, for the 10 nights of Muharram, we'd go to two Husseiniyas. We'd first go to Husseini Mission, or Husseini Islamic Mission in Hounslow, they would hire in the 70s a house or a hall where for 10 days a year we get together and we'd commemorate uh, Sayyidah Shahada alayhi salam. And then there'd be a late night maj majalis held uh, by Muhammad the Trust in um, Acton Town Hall. So each year as a child, 10 days uh, a year, we'd, we'd all get together and uh, we would mourn for Sayyidah Shahada alayhi salam. As a child in the 70s, there was very little, if any, media when it came to the story of Karbala. Um, you had no English speakers, no English majalis. It was normally held either in your own language, as in your own mother tongue, be it English or Arabic or Farsi. Um, so for a child growing up, uh, there was very little information out there. But in around 1980 or 1979, um, to celebrate the 14th century um, of Hijra, Idar Jafria published a book. It was a very simple book, and um, the book itself only contained 14 pages, 14 double pages, one page about each holy Masumin, and one page showing their holy shrine. So as a child, these were the first pictures I ever saw um, of Karbala and Najaf and Mashad. And you know, Almost every night, especially in Muharram, you'd come home at night, you'd open the book, you'd look at the pictures in great detail because it was very fascinating for a child to see, wow, this is how it looks. There's a golden dome and there's minarets and you're probably unsure what a dome looks like because in London there were no domes, there were no mosques here, there were no centres here, there were no purpose-built centres here. So for a child, this is all very foreign and very new and also very exciting. So that was my, my first sort of time I saw pictures of Karabala and the Jeff and I understood how grand they were. So basically back in the 70s and early 80s, um, Azdari was very limited. It was basically held for 10 days and one day for Urbane, as there were very few um, actual centres. And then mostly on weekends at people's houses, they would hold majalis. And you'd find every weekend, you'd probably find you know, one or two majalis to go to. So that was the, how Azadari was in London in those days. Um, in terms of Ziyarat and, the, and going to Iraq, my grandfather, who was a, a lawyer by, by profession in India, uh, was a, a very affluent writer, and um, he had written extensive diaries about his life, and especially about him traveling to, um, to Iraq. For example, in the 1920s, his first visit as a student to Iraq. Now in those days, going to Iraq from India was very different. It would take weeks to get there. You'd catch a train to, to Bombay. From B Bombay, you'd catch a ship, and you'd go to Basra. So there was a lot more effort, a lot more expense, a lot more, a lot more hardship in going to um, Karbala. So he wrote quite extensive diaries and talked about his experiences how he found the people in Iraq, how he found the people in Iran, for example. And that was also inspiring to see that my grandfather, when he went as a student, 
and later went to the 1950s, again back to Iraq, and again talking about how things had changed. That was very inspiring. Myself, um, in, in the early 70s, I was two years old, and my parents decided to go to, go to Pakistan, but they deliberately went by, by car so that we could go to Iraq and Iran for Ziyarat. Now, I have no memories of those Ziyarats, but, but my, my siblings have told me stories. And also my father took photographs, black and white photographs in, in, the, in the 70s uh, of us in Karabala, in Ghazmain, in Mashhad, for example. So that was my sort of early childhood experiences. Also, in the 80s, we, we had the Iran-Iraq war. So due to the war, very few people, if any, were going to Iraq for Ziyarat. People were going, were going to Iran, but very few were going, if any. There were no organized groups from London going to Iraq. Uh, in those days, so very few people had, gone, had been there and there are very people who you knew who, had, who could talk to you about Karabala and what it's like. And when it came to my first real experience of Ziyarat, that was in 2001, uh, where my family and I and some close uncles and aunts, we went to uh, Iraq. Now in 2001, going to Iraq was very different to today. Um, there were no flights into Iraq, so we would go um, to Syria to Damascus or to, or to Jordan to Amman and from there go by road. When we arrived in Ghazmain, I was very surprised. Um, I knew we had to keep a low profile as in not to speak to anybody but you went to this holy shrine and they were empty. You went to Karabala, it was empty. You'd go in the morning at Fajr time when they opened the doors uh, and within, even, even after, in, after, after half an hour when it was Tavr Jamaat, it was very quiet. The number of pilgrims in Iraq was minimal, um, simply because of the security, security situation in Iraq. When we went to Garabala for the first time, I think everybody had their wishes. Because in those days, so few, few people went to Iraq, everybody had a list, can you please pray for me for this or for that? And everybody had their desires, their, their own worries, or which they wanted to try and um, asked the Imams to intercede on their behalf. The shrines in those days were very old um, in terms of um, there was no renovation work going on except in Majid Kufa. Um, so in, we were there, it was, it, was, it was almost like going back a hundred years compared to how it is today. Um, in terms of if you look at the shrines then and today, there's a big difference. If you look carefully at the shrines, they may look similar, to how they were 20 years ago, but they have changed extensively in terms of renovation works. So I always had a passion that the book I had seen in, in the 70s and the 80s, showing pictures of Karabala, for example, I would want to take the same picture or the same angle or try and improve on the photographs. So in 2001, I took about 300 photographs uh, of my trip in Iraq, and I tried to take as many angles as possible in those days, taking photographs in the courtyards was fine, but taking photographs inside the actual Holy Shrine, where the Zuri is, was prohibited. And you had um, security officials and plainclothes police officers everywhere in the Holy Shrines, watching your every move. So it was difficult to take pictures inside the actual building itself, but outside was fine. So what I would try and do, take my camera inside in a plastic carry bag, make a small hole for the lens, and take pictures. Now, in Karabala, I, at the time of Fajr, when the doors opened and we rushed inside, the shrine was empty. So I took pictures, but unfortunately I was stopped by a plainclothes police officer who took me downstairs into an office. I spent about one hour there. He was asking me questions and finally I was allowed to go. As soon as um, the invasion in 2003 took place, um, just three of us, four of us actually, we managed. We decided to go to Karabala for Ashura. This was the first Ashura, the first free Ashura. Now bear in mind, previous to that, three years earlier, I had been to Iraq where it was very quiet, where every shrine was empty. And suddenly we arrived um, in, uh, on the border. We flew to Jordan, to Amman. We hired a, a, a GMC, an American Jeep with a driver to take us um, to Garabala direct from Amman airport. And um, when suddenly we crossed the border, we saw people walking. And there were people everywhere walking from Basra 
um, to Gobala for Ashura. You saw women, children, people on pushchairs. I'm very mindful, almost 30 years, there have been no Azadari, no commemoration in the months of Muharram and Safar um, in Iraq, especially for the local people, because it was not safe for, for Iraqis to go to Karbala. And um, when I arrived in Karbala, I was just overwhelmed where it was so busy. You know, I had my previous record three years earlier, where the streets were empty, it was amazing to see so many people um, there in Karbala. And bear in mind, the, the Khadims there, the authorities in Karbala, it was their first time they were having pilgrims arrive on a mass scale after 30 years. Many people well, even hadn't, had no recollection. They hadn't been born. Uh, in a, you know, all they had seen since, since they were born was restrictions in Karbala and Najaf and, and hardly ever the opportunity to go for Ziyara even though if you lived in Gobla itself, it was difficult to go inside the Holy Shrine. And suddenly this influx of pilgrims from all around the world in 2004 for the first ever Ashura, it was amazing. I managed to um, get a, um, a press pass and on 2004 on the day of Ashura, I was uh, on the roof of the Haram of Sayyid Shohada next to the minarets. And um, I remember this very, very vividly exactly at 10 o'clock on the day of Ashura, the first our free Ashura, a bomb, a bomb exploded. It exploded, I'd say, probably a mile, a mile behind Ville Zenobia. And every two minutes, a bomb exploded. And the last bomb which exploded was very close. It was right next to or behind the Rosa of Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam. And the black smoke was for at least two hours was rising from that scene. And it, because it happened outside the shrine, it was a place where many women and children were sitting, uh, watching the procession. And there were heads, there were limbs all over the place. But you know what? Despite those people being killed, becoming martyrs for Sayyidi Shaudah Salam, the Azadari, the procession, the Labaik Ya Hussein did not stop. People were not scared that, you know, women and children had just been blown up and killed five minutes earlier, but the procession and the Azadari continued. And that was so awesome to see where death did not scare anybody. People didn't run away, let's go back to the hotel, it's not safe. Everything carried on. There was obviously, um, at that time, a complete blackout when it came to mobile phones. No phones were working. These bombs which exploded in London, everyone knew about it. It was on the BBC News and all news channels. And, and family members were concerned. How is my son? How is my brother? How is my sister? All those who were you know, with us. But Alhamdulillah, we, we were absolutely fine. But we couldn't get through to London until the following day. And that, of course, caused a lot of anxiety for families waiting for news in London. Then when it came to 2018 last year, that was the first time after many years when Urbain was on a Tuesday. We all have to be here for Urbain, for the procession, which is on Sunday in London, after Urbain. But last year, Urbain fell on a Tuesday. So there's a five day gap. And that I thought was the, was, the, was the inspiration, the ideal opportunity that we can go to Karabala for Urbain and come back in time for the London procession. So this was like a unique opportunity after many years and also, I've spoken to many ulama who were studying in Najaf in the 1960s. And in those days, they were saying that mainly only students from Najaf would walk to Karbala. So it was the students who were at the Holza in Najaf, they would walk uh, to um, Karbala for Urbain, but only for Urbain was the walk in the Maqsul's time. But now, of course, over the last five, ten years, you've seen through videos through uh, to like Safir TV and other channels, you have seen how grand, how large Urbain has become. And the amazing thing is those people who normally wouldn't, wouldn't walk more than 100 yards, for example, in, in their own homes or in London or wherever they live, in Pakistan or in America or in Paris, everybody wants to walk during Urbain. Within our community, 
and not just the Shia community. I've, I've met Sunni brothers and sisters who also want to join this walk from the Jatif Karabala. It's amazing how people who say they shahada are prepared to walk 100 kilometers in the open air. It's easier said than done. Because if you're not an athlete or you, go to, or you don't go to the gym, you don't do jogging, for example, walking 100 kilometers, about 60 miles, in a foreign country where it's, um, it's quite hot, the weather's hot, um, it can be a challenge. But everybody you speak to all say, we want to go, whether you're a child, whether you're a grandmother, you want to walk, you want to, you want to be in that environment, you want to see and experience Urbane. And Urbane now, as we all know, is very big, be it 15, 20, 30 million people, all converging in the same place. And the facilities are amazing. I mean, I'm overweight and I thought, yes, well, we'll walk from Lajita Kobala, I'm bound to lose some weight. Actually, I gained weight, even though I walked it in two and a half days, but there is so much food and drink being served in the name of Sayyid al Shoda for the Zawar, for the pilgrims. It's amazing. People come out of the houses of their homes and they open their homes up, their bathrooms, their living rooms to come and sleep with us, use our, have a shower, offering you food. I think it's very hard to visualize when you watch a TV or you watch uh, videos, actually being there I think is very different to what you see on TV. The whole environment, uh, we say in, in Urdu kehfiyat, as in like the whole atmosphere is, is so electric that everyone is there. You'll see people from complete different backgrounds, different languages, different cultures, all converging together, all walking together. You'll meet people from Canada, from people from Basra, people from Iran especially, from all over India, Pakistan. You'll people, we met a group from, from Jakarta, from Indonesia. They had come as a group and they were all Indonesian Muslims who had come from there. So, Urbane is a real global unifying event, you know. Your people, your mosque for example that you go to, or your Husseinia you go to, you meet the same people every day you go there, probably from also the same culture. Here you're bringing together people from all kinds of cultures and they're all there for the same reason. And to actually be there and see that is uh, an experience you'd always remember especially at Urbane, where it is so busy. I remember when we, uh, when we first decided to go for Urbane, um, the excitement, even though most of us have been to Kerala many times, but the excitement of finally being able to go for Urbane was you know, really incredible. When we left, of course, Najaf, you saw all the polls and the poll numbers, and everyone knew that these poll numbers would direct us towards Kerala, and as the poll numbers you know, it's changed, we, get, we got closer and closer. But when we arrived in Kerbala, because there were so many people, the main road was closed off and the army was diverting you. And there were no signs, no pole signs, or no, nothing telling you which way to go. So for us, we, by that time we were all split up and we all aimed to reach our hotel. Everybody had the hotel card in their phones so they knew where to go to, if they get lost. Eventually we got to to Kerbala, and we finally saw the first rose that we saw was Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam, and then of that of Sayyidi Shah that Imam alayhi salam. I think for everybody, it was such a rewarding experience to finally achieve an ambition uh, where we, we all wanted to achieve and manage to walk unaided from Najaf to Kerbala, to get to Kerbala, to arrive in the holy city, and eventually after a few hours to find your way to the holy shrine and finally see the minarets, uh, for all of us was very humbling. Uh, and uh, uh, for us, we'd finally managed to do what we came out to do. And um, it's 24 hours as Dali in Karbala. The same in Ghazme and Najaf. During the, during the Ayyam, the days of Muharram and Safar, continuous Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, day and night, it doesn't, it doesn't stop. It's not a one day event. And I think for us, just the environment of our reign and the fact that you're surrounded by people and all doing the same thing, all there for the same intention. Traveling in, just inside Bainia Haramain takes a long time in our reign. To, 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 to be there for 
Jamaat for at prayer time. It's very difficult to pray in Jamaat because you have to be there about an hour early because the rows become completely packed and, and they overflow at that time. Um, when it came to the day of Arbain, we were lucky enough that our hotel was so close to the Haram that the view, we could see Bain al-Haramain and the two holy shrines very clearly. And that's where we recited um, Ziyarat al-Arabain from, and where we tried to remember all our family and friends and their hajat. In terms of reminding us of our trip, I like collecting artifacts. I have a small Husseini at home in our house. And um, when we, over the last many years, I've been collecting things from Iraq. For example, as we all know, because of the, of the renovation works and also the damage due to exposures in Samara, many of the tiles, for example, of the walls have been replaced and you're able to collect these tiles from the Holy Shrines and then have them in your home. At the same time, during Arabain, we managed to um, collect a carpet uh, from Ghazmain, from Baghdad. And equally, I have one carpet from the rolls of Hazrat Bas in, in my small um, Husseini at home. And again, whenever I enter the room, I walk on this carpet and it reminds me that I'm in Karbala. So these are small things which to me are really important. They're only carpets and they're old carpets. But because they have a link to holy shrines, whenever we have the opportunity and we pray there, you feel special that even though we're in London, we still feel like we're in Karbala or we're in Karzumain. In terms of going for Ziara, I think each time has been a different experience. Going in 2001, where it was very quiet and able to you know, be right at the front of each um, Zeri. Then going in Ashura um, in 2004, the first free Azadari. And each time you go, things look different, you have different experiences. Even though you may be going to the same places, it's amazing how things change and people you meet. I think one thing of going to Fort Urbain is that you meet all kinds of people from different backgrounds and they talk to you about their experiences and how they found Gorbala. But um, I think now, I think last year I managed to go twice to Gorbala. I think all holy shrines, be it the Kaaba in Mecca, be it Medina, but I think the shrine of Sayyid Shoda Salam in Gorbala seems to have this special environment, this special atmosphere where you feel so um, humble to be honoured to be inside his holy shrine, even though we've been before many times. But I think when you enter the shrine of Sayyidina Shahidah Islam, it is a unique experience. You know, you can go inside the shrine. And yes, in Arabian it's much more busier, it's more difficult to go inside, it takes longer to go inside. There's no space for your shoes. You often have to walk barefoot from your hotel because there's nowhere to keep the shoes. But when you enter the actual shrine, you can stand in the courtyard, which is, which is now covered, day and night, not feel tired. Just watching, looking at the holy shrine, looking at the zeri, looking at the ceiling, looking at the floor, looking at people just entering, looking at the, those in wheelchairs, looking to children. I remember there was this child from Pakistan and he's wearing sunglasses. He's about nine years old. And there were children, there were people around him and there was a Maulana, a priest with him. And I asked him, why is he wearing sunglasses? And this child had no eyes. He could not see, he had no eyes. His both eyelids were, were sealed. And I think we don't realize that the people come with all kinds of different hajats and problems. And when you see a 12-year-old child or a nine-year-old child who's come with no eyes, and he has come. So you imagine the effort that he has made to meet the Imam. Another thing what I found, especially during the walk, which is important to mention for everybody, especially if you're going for the first time to go for the, for the Arabian walk, is that you meet people all the time who tell them, oh, I'm, you know, I'm so tired, or I've, you know, I, you know, I walk from here to here and from here to here. And, you know, and people should be invitedly proud of their achievement of walking from Najat Karbala, walking 60 miles. But I always reminded people, I said, look, you were lucky. You know, you had, you know, food and water and drinks and massages and um, facilities for toilets, for, for camps on the whole journey. 
you were treated like VIPs. You were given so much food that, you know, you didn't need anything with you. You could walk without any kind of provisions. But imagine what happened after Gobra. If you look at how, say, the Dennis of Ramadan, how all the people made captives and they were forced and they were marched from Gobra to Kufa, as in, in the opposite direction uh, that we walk. How they suffered. You know, we, we have not suffered at all. You know, we have walked and had the best facilities. Uh, you know, you can't, I think we can't, we've done nothing. What have we done? We've walked from A to B, but you know, if you compare our journey to their journey, we are nothing. And I think that it's putting your ziyara into, into perspective. Why are we here? We've come here to mourn for Sayyidah Shoda and what happened on the day of Ashura and what happened on the day of, the day of Arabain and in between. The sufferings of the captives of the Ayl al and the followers and the women, the survivors. And look at what, what they endured and what we endured. You know, we had a very, very beautiful experience with no hardships and look what they did. I think we all have a connection to Sayyidah Shoda and especially by going to Karbala, you finally feel very close to the Imam. When you see the holy shrines, you see the dome, you see the minarets, and then you go inside and you see Hazrat Habib ibn Mazah, his, his holy shrine. Uh, and then Hazrat Ibrahim, uh, who was the first person who would uh, welcome the Zabar, the son of the seventh Imam, his holy shrine. And then you come inside to the main chamber and you see, actually see the Zari. This is where Sayyidah Shawda is buried. This is where Hazrat Ali Asghar is buried, where Hazrat Ali Akbar -Islam is buried, all together in, in one place. Then the Shahada al Karbala. And then even more moving is the Qatarga, the actual Maqam al Shahada, the small room with the red lights, um, where is the actual place where the Imam's head was severed. And these places are all very close together. And during Arabain, it's very crowded, of course. But each place has its own special feeling. You know, when you're by the Zeri, especially by Qatarga, when you look inside and you see the red lights, and say, this is where the Imam was killed by himself. So it's, I think leaving is, is, is the most difficult part of Karabala, is to leave because you don't want to leave. I, mean, I must admit, if, if, I think for most people who've been to Karabala, if they could spend two months or three months there a year, they would love to stay, spend that time there. If they could afford to do so, and had the, had the time, I would love to spend two months, three months a year just in Karbala, because you feel so much at, at home. We're not Iraqi, we're not Arabs, but even then we feel at home in Karbala. Karbala is our home. It's our, it's our faith, it's our origin, it's everything to us. And I think you get that experience by going to Karbala. I think my experience, especially at, at Arabain, is simply about connection. That's what Arbain is, what Karbala is. It's your connection with the Imam. And that's what I think is the most important part of Ziyara, is that you go and you feel as that you have met the Imam. No doubt the Imam is everywhere, but when you're in Karbala and you're facing the Zari, you feel very special, very, very special and very humble that you are in the presence of the Imam. And that's what it is. You go there, you connect, it's like you're with the Imam. And that's the most amazing experience one can ever have. لبيك يا حسين لبيك يا حسين لبيك يا حسين لبيك يا حسين